Lift up Christ. Tell the world. God is good. All the time. Siabong. I greet you all in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May I see the visitors amongst us. A home without visitors is not a home. May I request them to kindly stand as we welcome them. If you are coming for the first time or if you are not used to coming to Kempton Park, you're just visiting today, please stand. You are an Adventist or non-Adventist. Can we acknowledge and recognize you? I see my couple there. May I kindly ask you to stand as well? She told, me, she told me the same name, but I just forgot it now. <laughs> what does the church say? Amen. Can the people next to them stand and welcome them? You can hug, do a holy kiss if you can. <laughs> just show that they are welcome. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. You are invited to be part of every program we have. We even have a program for the stomach. Uh, lunch is served for everyone after the main service. And then in the afternoon, you've got programs for everyone. You're all welcome. So let's all rise and sing number 57. Sounds good. Let's go. Beautiful. I love it. Let's go. Let's try number three. Let's go. No one will see his and the church says, let's go. Sounds good. Let's go. Eh? Let's go. Thank you. The church may be seated. I greet the church in the name of our Lord. Amen. As we read for Ophetry, we are going to use the scripture in Genesis chapter 28, 
verse 20 to 22. Here we are going to share the experience of a young man, a young man called Jacob, as he was running away from the threat of death in the hands of his brother. We see Jacob has to run to his uncle where he was going to get shelter. But on his journey, in the middle of a jungle or in the middle of nowhere, he had to sleep somewhere in the middle of a jungle. And the Bible tells us as he was sleeping, he met God. In the morning as he woke up, he realized that he met God. He looked back to his experience. He knows that anything could have happened to him while he was sleeping. If everything could have happened to him while he was walking. He could have been eaten by the wild beast or anything, or he could have been attacked by other nations. But he realized that God was always with him. And let's hear after Jacob has gone through this experience and the realization what he says in verse 20 of 28, again, as he says, and Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God will be with me, and I will keep, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and remnant to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Jacob, through his experience, he realized that he is nothing on his own. And everything that he has is a blessing from God. And as a result of that, he realized that everything that he has belongs to God. And I just want to say to us here that everything that we have or that make us, it is a blessing that God has bestowed in us. The love that we get from other people is what the Lord is blessing us with. And all the supplements that we get to sustain our families, is what God is blessing us with us. And only once we realize that all these are blessings from God, the learnings that we find here is that Jacob vowed that he will give tenth back to God. And for us is that for all that God is blessing us every day of our life, look back to your week today. Look to the week that has just passed and say, what has God blessed you with? And what offering are you giving to God for the blessing that he has bestowed in you? And that's what we learn from the experience of Jacob. Let's bow our heads. Let's kneel down as we pray. We thank you, God. You are the God of love. We thank you, God, that you are the God, the creator. We thank you, God, that you are not just God the creator, but you have created us. We thank you, God, that you didn't just create us, but you showed love to us just before we can even know you. Father, we open our heart unto thee today. We offer ourselves, knowing that our sustenance depends on you, on our own. We are nothing. And Father, we say that we commit ourselves to give you offering and to give you tenth of all that you bless us with. And Father, we said, when we are challenged, we call upon your Holy Spirit to inspire our heart to fight temptation of the devil. And Father, I pray that you bless each and every one of us individually so that we are able to give you back what you have blessed us with. And we offer you.
Let's take him number 288. 288. They brought their gifts to Jesus. But by let his na 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 na. Two. They brought their gifts to Jesus and made him now his feet.
Um, before we sing number 57, first and last stanza, it's an honor and privilege to have Pastor Nechifulan amongst us. Um, I feel very small to introduce him because he, if the pastor was around, he's the one who was going to give or to introduce you, my pastor. But we are welcome uh, to our church and feel welcome. Pastor Nechuflani is he served the church locally, conference level. He's now at the union where he's heading Adra. Do we know what Adra is? What does it stand for? You said you know it. What is Atra? We see those who joined the church yesterday. Atra is a very old department that is still existing in the church. So U Pastor Nechiflan is coming to promote Atra. You'll know all about it. But for those who might have forgotten it's Adventist or it's Adventist Development and Relief Agency. Is what? Adventist Development and Relief Agency of the Seventh day Adventists. He will tell us all about it when he, I think, more in the afternoon. All right? Amongst us, we have Umama Umfundisi Unichifulan. Can I just ask you to stand, Mama, for people? She's known also, just for those who don't know her. Amen. You are welcome, Mam Fundis. Thank you so much for coming. And you are welcome, Mam Fundis, as well. What does the church say? Amen. Let's sing first and last stanza of number 57, then the pastor will take over. Let's rise and sing the song. Number 57. Lord, why you? Whosoever will too. Lord, why you? My God, and the town. He from heaven he died. He saw the world around. Now at the joyful night, by to the man is found. Oh, your mind. That's nice. You sound good. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Amen. I want to greet the church this morning or this noon in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.
We are quite delighted to be here with you today. And I hope we will all be back in the afternoon when we share with you what Adra is all about and how you can also be Adra. Uh, that is the main reason why I am here. However, for now, we will just go through a devotional or a sermonette, which is also the gospel according to Adra. Amen. For our scriptural reading, we are going to go to the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We can't miss it, eh? The first book of the Bible and the first chapter of the book. Can I read it? And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Full stop. Our loving Father, we come before your presence this noon. As much as we have gone through this passage, we now invite you to make your passage in our lives. Amen. Amen. I want us to address ourselves under the caption, The Human Telos. Telos spells T E L O S. The human telos. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful. Number one. Number two, multiply. Number three, subdue it. Number four, have dominion. A telos. This word has its origins or etymology from the Greeks, and it means the ultimate end, E-N-D. It means purpose, or it means an overall or overarching goal. A telos is an end or a purpose and in a fairly constrained sense used by philosophers such as Aristotle, he is the person who gave it much of the meaning. It is the root of the term teleology, roughly meaning that the study of purposiveness or the study of objects with a view to their aim, purposes, or intentions. In other words, the approach here about telos is that everything has been created to achieve a particular end, and there is no confusion. The sun is there to provide energy and govern the light. The water is there to exert pressure on the earth, gravity and also to maintain its balance, and also to nourish the plants. So everything has got an end, but the end that we are talking about today is a human one. Genesis chapters one and two impose an inherent limitation for our understanding. Both these passages, chapter one and chapter two, are a residual of the revelation of what happened before the fall of man 
or before sin invaded our world. Sin is not just the transgression of God's law as defined by the Bible itself, but it is also an epistemological prism through which we assign meaning to all that we see, hear, and experience. To a greater extent, we do not understand reality as it is, but we understand reality and see it as we are from our personal perspectives. Much of the meaning that we assign is more subjective rather than objective. We assign meaning and apply a minutical interpretation to these pre-seen passages like Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, but through our sin-tainted understanding or interpretation. So that is the beauty about chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. In chapter 1, there is no sin. And in chapter 2, sin has not yet entered the world. You'll find the sin in chapter 3. But our reading and understanding of these two chapters, before sin came in, we understand them and interpret them using or from the ground where we are standing of chapter 3 of being seen tainted people. And therefore, when an imperfect man tries to interpret and understand the perfect situation, he makes, he makes or his standing makes the perfect situation to be imperfect by virtue of his personal imperfection from where he is standing. So we will never truly grasp and appreciate Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 because we needed to be people who had lived before sin. And only Adam had a bit of a glimpse of what chapter 1 and chapter 2 were all about. And where are we going with this? We are trying to say, from where we are standing as sinful, being, looking the world through sinful, tainted prisms or glances, and trying to assign meaning to a sinless text, the, the other side, it has also made us to misunderstand even Genesis or to have a limited understanding of what Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 is all about. And accordingly, our current and is of biological fruitfulness. When we hear, because we are created to be fruitful, and our understanding of fruitfulness is that one of biological yeah, progression and procreation. And when we read about multiplication, we understand exponential multiplication of populating the earth through a biological birth multiplier effect. We have been created to multiply and therefore, whether we have them in marriage or not out, or outside marriage, we are still fulfilling God's mandate of multiplying. That is our understanding from where we are standing. And when the Bible talks about subduing the earth, our understanding, our default understanding is that of subduing the earth through overpopulating it by or with human offsprings. And the more we make these children and overpopulate the earth to the point that the earth fails even to sustain its inhabitants. We say we have subdued it, and that is what Genesis is all about. And the fourth thing we seek also to achieve, and which we think we do achieve from where we are understanding, that of 
having dominion over the earth. Our default understanding is that we, it, is, it is meant that as human beings, we must dominate the earth through pegging our own presence in every corner of the earth. If in every corner of the earth you find a human being, then you must know that we are dominant. When our population is more than that of the birds, we have become dominant. When our population is more than that of animals, our understanding is that we have achieved the divine mandate to dominate. Amen. And I am saying, this is not what the Bible is saying, but this is how we understand it from where we are standing. Because this passage was written before the fall of sin, or it tries to describe a situation before the fall of sin, I mean, before the fall of man. And unfortunately, we are forced to try and to grasp what it means from a sin-tainted mind. This kind of a view necessarily, if we take this to be the, the interpretation of this subject or of this particular verse, verse 28, it therefore would mean that our existence as human beings have been assigned status similar to that of animals. whose life mode is an endless cycle of eating. It means if we are just born to eat like animals, we are still fulfilling our end. And from eating, we go on to look for the shelter. When you build a beautiful mansion and a house, you are no different from an ant that burrows a hole, or a fox that burrows a hole on earth to get a shelter. When you stay in a three-story man three mansion, you have not made any achievement better than that of a fox. Both of you have a shelter. Amen. Amen. When you eat your food only from Woolworth's grocery store. You are no different from the cow that grazes on the meadows. Both of you are eating. When we get married and have kids, we are not different also from goats. They also have kids. And a kid is actually a baby goat. So we are not different from goats when we make kids. And we are actually affirm it when we say, you know, we have kids. We are just saying we are just like goats. Even our babies are like baby goats. Amen. And after mating animals or after production, what do we do? We both die. And then the cycle repeats itself. Eating, shelter, mating, dying. Eating, shelter, mating, dying, endless. And I am saying, or we are trying to say that, if we think that what the Bible is saying when it says, be fruitful, it means you must have babies. Multiply, it means you must have more than two. Subdue the earth, it means you must have a clan everywhere on the face of this Republic of South Africa. And when it says dominate, it means our population must be more than that of animals. We are no different from animals. If that is what we understand Genesis chapter 128 to be saying. 
This animal mode of existence is amoral since it is just a happening as opposed to a doing. In other words, for you to go through that phase of being born, eating, have a shelter, I mean, you even go to school so that you can get a shelter. Go and get a PhD so that you can get a better shelter, which is not different from a basic shelter of a fox. Go to, your, to a university that you may get a better salary to afford grocery from Woolworths, but in actual fact, no different from a cow or a beast that is grazing grass that is freely given to it. And if this is how we define human progression and blessings, then we are not different from animals because animals are able to achieve all those things without the pronouncement of blessings. From Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, we understand that God's blessing upon mankind was to set a differential trajectory from animal life mode that will distinguish man from animal life. And human being has been blessed. How come he still lives like an animal? Then something is missing. The question is whether there is a possible way in which to assign meaning to being fruitful, multiplication, subduing, and the dominion that define the blessing bestowed upon men. And we will try to venture to give a little bit or to cast a bit of a shadow because we are struggling to and attempting to understand this pre-sin text, but from a sinful standpoint of view. Being blessed, as in God blessed them. From Webster's Dictionary, it means being endowed, being favored, being granted, being entrusted, being furnished, built and well architectured, being conferred, being predisposed, being cultured, and ordained to realize a predestined end that defines one's life. That is what being blessed means, literally. Are we together, church? In this context, it means that as a people, we have been endowed, in other words, within us, there is this kind of a design and a presence and a seed which responds to what God says when he says, you must be fruitful. He makes you to have the potency to be fruitful before he commands you to be fruitful. When God said be fruitful, he meant that we are endowed with the potent power to be productive, not as just in making a baby. Are we together? But to be productive as in creativity. To be constructive, it means to be useful. To be fruitful means to be worthwhile. To be fruitful means to be helpful. In other words, you help God to meet his grand design about you or about this planet. To be fruitful means to be beneficial. It means to be valuable. It means to be rewarding. It means to be profitable. It means to be advantageous, to be fruitful, not to be wasteful. When God looks at you, he must not say, you know, I really wasted my material. 
you are not even worth the soil out of which you were created. That is when you are defined to be wasteful. But that is exactly the opposite of what we have been created to. It means, to be fruitful means to be successful. It means to be effective. If me, it means to be effectual. It means to be well spent. In a, if you are a salt, you must have been emptied. Whoever comes to try to empty you must say, you know, this salt was well spent. It's empty. It's not full. We have a nice example in the Bible of a salt that was never spent. When the Bible says, without making a digression, but just to make a point, remember Mrs. Lot. It's a subject for another day. Mrs. Lot became a pillar of salt after looking back. And sometimes we have a way of trying to judge God as harsh, ruthless, and cruel. For the way in which he wasted the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But what made God to come down and do the investigation? He was not coming to investigate whether the sinful life of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah was real, authentic, factual, and historic. But what he came down to investigate was whether the salt that he had put in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah was probably misplaced or it was never endowed in Mrs. Lot and the whole family of Lot. And the Bible says that morning before he could destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he pulled them out of the city. And Mrs. Lot turned back and she became a pillar of salt. And why did she become a pillar of salt? That was a demonstration for, to heaven and earth to the angels that do not blame the destruction of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah on the Sodomites themselves, but blame it on this woman called the church, Mrs. Lord, whose salt was never spent. When you are said to be gainful, well spent, it means if God was to say, can you turn back, may we see how much salt you are. When we have to be transformed into a salt, if we have to be transformed into our equivalent, which is the salt, we must be found like a nothing. Because our salt has been spent here on this life before we die. And unfortunately, the truth is that most of the Christian graves are a bunch of salt instead of being a bunch of nothing. Salt being used out, not taken into the grave. So when God says, be fruitful, he means be well spent. Go to the grave empty. And it's good that it's only Mrs. Lord who has turned, who turned back. Do you know what would have happened if Lord himself had turned back? We probably would have seen a mountain of salt. Salt that was never spent. But unfortunately, being 
human means being created in the image of God. But means being created to be fruitful and to be well spent as in leading and living a productive life. We do have two categories of labor, productive and non-productive labor. The meaning of a productive life has been lost, unfortunately, in the bureaucratic arrangements of production. The current arrangement has tainted our understanding of productivity. And maybe just to use one example to explain what I'm trying to say. Imagine a, a real life situation where a miner digs and extracts gold from the belly of the earth. And as he goes down into shaft number 17 to dig that earth, above him is a unit supervisor who does not dig. Then there is a shaft supervisor who also does not dig. And then there is a general manager to whom the shaft supervisor reports. And the general manager also does not dig the gold. And above the general manager, there is an overall CEO or the chief accounting officer who only attends board meetings and meetings, and he never digs. This one too, the CEO reports to the chairperson who is accountable to the investors. Both the chairperson and the investors do not dig. It's only one man who is digging. At the bottom of tire number seven, the person who is involved in productive labor is the miner who physically extracts gold mineral from the earth. To complicate the picture more, they will even hire a security officer who gets employed to ensure that all the gold that is extracted by the miner is safely extracted and transported to where it is going to be deposited for safekeeping. Then there will also be a, a sales manager who is employed to sell that very same gold, and he never digs it. And there's, there's, then there is an accountant. An accountant is brought in to allocate the income realized from its sales as direct costs, investment, and also surplus. The other six people above him, or seven, who are set and arranged to manage his productivity, are themselves not engaged in any productive activity. The productive labor of the miner is shared among these seven vertical layers of bureaucracy and many more others who go horizontal like the accountants whom he does not report to and the salesperson and the security guards. But the productive person is one, the minor. However, sometimes we get to be told that the CEO himself is very productive when he does not dig gold at all. And comes the end of the year, he even gets performance bonuses are over and about the gold which he never dug. People who live in labor, as opposed to those who are really truly involved in productive labor. And those who are not involved in productive labor are more than those who are involved in productive labor. That is why we will never be able to get rid of poverty. Yeah. 
Amen. The current arrangement of labor, this is where we are trying to go to, is such that the productive laborer produces what he does not own. This mine digger, when he digs that mine, he does not even own it. And he cannot even own it. They don't even make him to, they don't even allocate shares to him. While the owner does not labor for the product that he owns. Mr. Oppenheimer does not go down and dig it. He just owns it. The blessings that God has pronounced in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, assume that the productive laborer, the miner himself who digs the gold, also owns the produce of his labor, or that the producer and the owner of the product are one and the same person. In other words, when you read from the book of Genesis, Exodus chapter 20, the text about the Sabbath, from verse 8 to verse 11, we will not go through it. But what it assumes is that, and what it suggests, and the import of its meaning is that, do not work the work that you do not and cannot own. You must own the work that you work. And work the work that you own and can own. Amen. Amen. And if we were to add a little bit of salt to the wound, if God had to choose between blessing the worker and the owner of the work who does not work the work that he owns, if he was to choose between blessing this worker who does not work the work that he works, and also between the other guy who owns the work that he does not work. Where do you think he will tilt his blessings to us? To the owner who does not work the work that he owns. Or will he bestow more blessings on the work, on the worker who works the work that he does not own? When you read the story of Joseph, Joseph tells us that God will still choose to own and has chosen to bless the owner who owns the work that he does not work as opposed to the worker who works the work that he does not own. The Bible says, and God blessed Potiphar for the sake of Joseph, who was a worker, working the work that he never owned. But the blessings went to Potiphar. And the Bible says Potiphar didn't know how much he was worth. He owned everything that he was not working. But Joseph was slaving for him. And the Bible says when God came down to do the blessing, he looked at his son whom he loved so much. But he said, my son does not own it. But for his benefit, I will go and bless Potiphar who owns it for the sake of this worker who owns nothing. And this is how far God is still willing to go. When he sees you not wishing to own it, 
but working so hard there for somebody who owns it. For your benefit, he says, you know, for the sake of my son, let me just bless him who does not even worship me. But because he owns it, and pays wages to this one. Joseph lived on a salary, but Potiphar lived on blessings. Joseph was God's son, Israel, but Potiphar was that Egyptian. Amen. When God says be fruitful, he's saying, be productive. Go and work the work that you own. And own the work that you work. So that when my blessings come to you, they are composite, they are not scattered. They don't go through a value chain. They come to you. Direct, not indirect. Amen. Then the second thing that God says is that we must then also multiply it. The word multiply means increase, increase not just through the addition value, but through exponential value. Multiply means to grow it. It means become more numerous. It means you must accumulate, or it must be more accumulative. It means to, pro to proliferate it. It means to mount it. It means to mushroom it, to snowball, by John, spread, expand, Literally to wax big, stronger in all dimensions. So when God said, be fruitful and multiply, he also meant you are further endowed or favored with the capacity and the power to multiply the product discussed above. In other words, you have not yet lived until you as a human being have found that product that can define your identity. If you want to become a tomato producer, go and master the production of the tomato and make it so powerful. Invest all your learnings, your PhDs just on a tomato not spread it, but on a tomato. When you get more money, invest it again on the same tomato because tomato is your product. And when you have mastered that production of a tomato, just one tomato, then you must then go to step number two. Figure how to multiply it. Because if it has got seed, it can be multiplied. I am not suggesting that we should become farmers. But have a product. If you become a motivational speaker or you are a preacher, multiply yourself. Multiply it. And as a matter of fact, Jesus never became a tomato producer but he was a preacher. But from day one, he started by working out on a project of multiplying himself. Before he preached the first sermon, he gathered himself the 12 himself. So that by the time he goes after three and a half years, he would have left three, I mean 12 Jesuses. They killed one Jesus, but he left 12 of them. And when they were coming for Jesus that day, 
they missed the point. Because they left the 12 to go away. And actually Jesus said the way he was so much concerned about his self-reproduction. He said, whom, do you, whom are you looking for? They said, we are looking for Jesus. He said, I am he. Me. And not these other guys. And for the second time they asked him. He said, I am he. And after saying that, he said, let this go their way. And what Jesus was saying was that, I have reproduced myself. If I die, let these ones not die. I have reproduced myself. I have 12. Although Judas was gone, but he was saying, these ones, I have reproduced myself. And they missed the point, and the devil missed the point. Those were the guys he should have started by killing. And Jesus was no more longer worried about the destruction of his message because he had left it on them. And see him when he resurrects. When he resurrects, he does not teach them any new thing. He just simply say, go and do everything that I taught you before I died. To the whole nation. So the bottom line is, identify your product. And when you have identified it, multiply it. We, we should not say, you know, Uba Batlata is gone, and Uba Batlata was a rich man, and after he's gone, all the shops get closed down, all the projects, they get closed down. Jesus also left, but when he left, nothing got closed down. And that means before we make it to follow Jesus to the grave first before we resurrect, let us multiply, multiply ourselves. The multiplication that we are talking about is not of having kids here and there but multiplying a product that you have. And if it is a tomato, multiply it after you have perfected it. Now that you have perfected the product, then you can go on to multiply it. Uh, around December last year, We were heading for home during the holidays. And I was the last person to lock the door. And after a week, I had to go back to Bloemfontein. I had not done what my wife had asked me to do. To put in sufficient electricity. And when I got in, the lights were off, everything was off. And my first area of concern was the refrigerator. I opened it. It was like I had opened up some tombs. <laughs> the whole house was having a stench. I began to remove them as much as I could. And everything was rotten. But I was actually... Uh, brought closer to the attention of a small pack of about six tomatoes. They were in a plastic bag. The refrigerator was so hot and everything had rotten. But when I picked up that packet, that plastic of tomatoes, all of them were fresh and still usable while everything was rotten. And those tomatoes, they came from ZZ2.
Now, ZZ2 has worked on that product called a tomato. And knowing that a tomato doesn't take long to rot, he made some genetic engineering to a point where you can send that tomato from here to Britain four weeks on the road, I mean four weeks wherever, going from one place to the other until it reaches the consumer. And that tomato will still be fresh, red as it is, and still edible. So Mr. ZZ2 invested everything on that tomato. Because the tomato is a product that defines Mr. ZZ2. And we all have a product. But more than that, Mr. ZZ2, I don't know how many farms he has, and all of them tomato farms. He's the sole supplier of tomatoes. You go to Swaziland, you will see ZZ2 box. You go to the US, you will still find ZZ2 box. He is supplying everywhere. Amen. Amen. Having multiplied your product, number three, God says you are not blessed until you have subdued it. Subdue means to conquer, it means to defeat, to vanquish, to get the better of, to overpower, to overcome, to overwhelm, crush, squash, quell, beat, trounce, subjugate, master, suppress, gain the upper hand over, triumph over. That is what to subdue means. It means to tame it, to hold it, hold in check, humble it, chasten, chasten it. Clobber it, demolish it. That is what it means to subdue it. Now, you have your product. And I then decided to check on some of these toys that men love so much. But this particular one was a drone. You see a drone. And it costed so much. And I wanted to know what is the magic about this particular drone. And the salesperson came and he was patient with me to explain what everything about this drone. He says, you know, this drone, 26 minutes in the air, is the, it can stay the longest flying. And it can also do up to 200 meters up, going up. And in case you become so reckless, and then you drive it towards a big building, the moment it senses an object around it, it has got sensors all over. It will stop before crashing anything. It just does not crash into an object. And I said, man, this is good because if it can't crash to anything, it means my investment, the risk profile is lower on it because it will not just crash. But that is exactly how some of us are. 
and more especially we Africans. We are like this. Some of us have this attitude of a highly sophisticated drone. The moment it senses an obstacle, it stops. It doesn't go the other side. And many of us, we are able to go through the phase of developing a product and then when it comes to multiplying it sometimes and dealing with some teething pro problems relating to its production or mass production, we say, you know, there is too much problem here. And because there is so much problem in getting this product okay, we abandon it. We really abandon it. And after abandoning it, it is abandoned. Somebody sometimes comes and picks it up and even employs us to work on it. And we keep on saying, you know, I'm the one who started that thing. But you abandoned it. But when God says subdue it, he's saying, when you find a problem on your product, on the product content or its multiplication, please, when you find problems, fight those problems until you subdue them. I mean, almost all of us here have come driving cars here. If you drive a Toyota 4x4, you see this Toyota. Then you do a Ford 3.2 wild track. They tell you that the moment it hits was 60, you must be ready to go and invest on a gearbox. Then you go for an A4 automatic. Then they tell you that it has got a problem with the gear, something that the automation. It hits 100,000. You must be ready to spend. You buy a Foxy, Volkswagen, they tell you, you know, the door panels have got a way of giving up. Where am I driving to? I'm trying to say, all these beautiful innovations which you see, they are not problem free. The best model is the one with less problems, not problem free. When they talk about the improved wild track seven or whatever, they will be saying that, you know, that gearbox problem has been resolved. They have attended to the previous problem. And Tina, most of us, when we meet a problem, we abandon the whole project. Everything that you buy and which you find, it's selling despite and in spite of problems and myriads of them. It starts with 1,000 problems. You eliminate them. When you have come to 100 problems that are still left, you say, I have the best latest model. And Tina, when we find a problem, we simply... And when the Bible says, subdue it, it means start with 1,000 problems of your product. Work on them until they become 100. And work on them until they become seven. And they give you a headache. You spend more, invest more on that in the resolution of those seven problems. And once you have overcome those seven problems, then we say, you are dominating. You now have dominion over the tomato. You are dominant. You have 
manage only not only to come with the product but also worked on its multiplication and then subdued all the problems come up with a whole protocol of resolving your problems related to your innovation or the work that you are doing are we together if your job is to bake maguinya and you sell them and people don't seem to be buying them more it doesn't mean that maguinya don't sell you might need to change your recipe you might need to change the customers the clients you might need to work more on your clients go and find out why the clients no longer like your maguinya rather than abandon it and say there is no money in maguinya you need to reduce it until you reduce all those problems and when you have reduced them and you now know even in your sleep that if this problem is presented it means the solution is this we know you have dominated that thing you now have dominion over the thing and when we want tomato we know if i want the best mentor on tomato i must go to mr zz2 because mr zz2 has dominated the tomato production and even its distribution and that is what defines the blessedness of a man and the telos of a man as per god's blessings and the next thing which i like about that text the text that we used the year for opening which reads and god blessed them firstly the word bless itself is an active verb but that is the first active verb to put all other active verbs in motion when it continues it says in his blessing he says be fruitful and by using the suffix be there it changes the whole noun into an active verb be fruitful are we together secondly multiply number 3 subdue it and then dominion it's a summary of the three achievements in other words all these three words which define our blessings be fruitful multiply and subdue are all active verbs and it means that god has put in us the capacity the competency the ability to be fruitful he will not say be fruitful if he have not made you to be fruitful and he will not say multiply if he has not put it in you to multiply and he will not say subdue it if he has not put in sufficient strength within you to to subdue it and our message to you today is that god has blessed you so be blessed the genesis of human telos that's the title of today thank you so much mfundis we are so blessed as i was sitting down i was thinking of a relevant song to this this was really a powerful message i i thought of number 80 but i'm i'm worried we may not know it that's the most relevant song number 80 it is sebenza sebenzani zinceku zika jehova sebenzani niphe abalambileyo sebenzani ke ukhona umsebenzi sebenzani ize ifike inkosi that's the most relevant song but usandile zulu will teach us later can we can we do 79
Go through that song. It's a powerful song. That's 279 for now. Let's stand. Let's stand. Let's stand. Amasi ama. Hamasi mu to Hamasi mu a lindi le a kope na ma bele e gute se wa boni le e se kahang ene si te songke ko si o Na yezwangu we we tonga sezwa ba tu me awo kubu na ge ngaga hajuli kubu ba tu me le. Egu se ni na tamba ma bange ni no ma se le sho ni langa ma ba fu hu ni si nyanga ko si yo. Zwangu we we tonga se zwa ba tu me abo guvu na i ngaga hajuli chovu we no tu nyayo. Ingo sevo ne se sama bele pege zulwe ne si pelo tolu humbu som kulu ko si o. Guvu na yezwangu we we tonga seza ba tu me abo. I one more time, one more time. Una yenga gahajuli one more time. Kobo kosi o guvu na yezwangu we we tonga sezwa ba tu me abo. Kufu na ye gaga hatuli shobo. Father, we thank you for this message today. In Jesus' name, amen.